Okay, so we are, we're doing the full origin of Old Man Logan, which I'm actually pretty excited about because the story is pretty amazing. But to catch you guys up who have not had a chance to read Old Man Logan yet, or who are lagging behind or just discovered my channel for the first time, whatever the case may be, the cool thing about Old Man Logan, or at least about the, the origin as we're getting it here, is that it covers really like the finer points, or not really the finer points, like the big points of his life, kind of the opposite of what I just said, but it covers like the most significant moments in his life, but it's designed to sort of parallel classic Wolverine and Old Man Logan next to one another. Now, all this goes all the way back to a story I'd say maybe a couple months ago about, you know, old man Logan being sent to some space station or something like that. And the idea was that the younger version of Jean Grey had basically been captured by a race called the Brood. We don't really need to know about them, but they're able to use the powers of other people for their own purposes. And they basically ended up forcing Jean Grey to drive old man Logan kind of insane in the sense that he basically started seeing all these illusions from when he was in the wastelands. That is to say, when he was in his other universe where all the superheroes had been killed off by all the supervillains. Now, the reason why this mattered is because at the end of the original Old Man Logan story, after Old Man Logan had killed all the members of the Incredible Hulk family and then rode off into the sunset, he had done that after taking Bruce Banner Jr. with him. But we didn't know what happened to Bruce Banner Jr. We just kind of knew that he rode off into the sunset and that was that. Now, uh, we ended up figuring out a little more, I guess, finding out a little more about that with regards to, you know, Jonathan Hickman's Fantastic Four. And it was the idea that Bruce Banner Jr. basically went on to become kind of a leader of a new generation of superheroes. But Old Man Logan doesn't know that. Instead, all he knows is what he's been forced to see by Jean Grey, which was that Bruce Banner Jr. basically became like a tyrant. He became a warlord and became another villain. And so because of that, the goal of Old Man Logan was to travel back to the wastelands and find a way to basically, you know, save Bruce Banner Jr. from becoming a bad guy. Now, the cool thing about this is that writer Jeff Lemire offers a sort of meta commentary on how different writers use time travel, because it's no secret that there are some writers out there that use time travel as an escape. They basically write a story, they back themselves into a corner, they don't know how to end it. So they're just like, well, time travel. And then every thing gets fixed. The funny thing about this is Lemire uses that, but the way that he sort of comments on it is that Old Man Logan begins going around to all these different members of the Marvel superhero community that have the ability to manipulate time. So like Scarlet Witch, Doctor Strange, some of those individuals who are technologically advanced, and they all basically say, no, we're not going to give you the ability to go back in time. Time is not something you can just kind of mess around with forever. You'll eventually screw things up. And so eventually he tracks down and locates an old villain of his named Osmodius. Now Osmodius is not really relevant here. I mean, he's relevant insofar that he has like his own little story, but we can cover that at the end. What we do know is that Osmodius is a guy who dabbled in like sorcery and different things like that. And so he basically gives old man Logan an amulet and says, as long as you hold this amulet, you will be able to go back to the wasteland and figure out what's going on. But if you let it go, you could potentially be stuck there. Now, of course, Osmodius doing this had his own nefarious purposes. And again, we'll find out what that is. But essentially what happened is that instead of the physical body of old man Logan being whisked into the past, what ends up happening is like his mind or his soul or whatever you want to call it, its essence, uh, basically gets attached to the amulet and it begins jumping from body to body. And that's why over the course of this story, we're going to see his physical appearance change because instead of his body physically being transformed, it's only his mind. And so his mind will jump from one point in his life to another. And that era will reflect one point or, you know, what point in time he's in. So, you know, a really good example of this is where we initially pick up with the war of 1812. Now, the funny thing about this is that Jeff Lemire really kind of says that like classic Wolverine, like the Wolverine you think of, who got his adamantium ripped out and just like loves killing stuff. You know, classic Wolverine and Old Man Logan are similar, but they're different. And the reason why I say that is because classic Wolverine was born shortly before 1900. He was born like 18, between 1870 something and 1890 something. I don't remember off the top of my head, uh, but there's no way he could have fought in the War of 1812. Old Man Logan did. And what this tells us is that Old Man Logan has a hundred years or so on the classic Wolverine. Now, the reason why this is also cool is because it also answers questions about like his healing factor. Because one of the big questions people always had and one of the questions I always saw in the comments is if Wolverine has a healing factor how does he get old? Well we answered that question before when we talked about like the nature of healing factors and adamantium and different things like that and we likened it to the idea of you hitting a tree stump right like in that video I said okay let's say that we give you like a plastic hammer and it only weighs a couple of ounces and I say okay I want you to start hitting this tree stump with this plastic hammer you'll be able to probably hit it for like hours and hours and hours but if I take away that plastic hammer and I give you a 50 pound hammer you won't 
be able to hit it for nearly as long. That metaphor applies to Wolverine in the sense that you hitting a tree stump with a plastic hammer is Wolverine's healing factor without adamantium. The adamantium is not poisoning his body, all he has to do is just recover from whatever injury he happens to sustain and basically stem the flow of his own aging process. But when adamantium was introduced to his body, now his body had to not only fight off adamantium, it also had to fight off whatever damage he sustained in whatever conflict he happened to be in, which is the equivalent of me giving you a 50 pound hammer and asking you to hit a tree stump. And so what this says is that in addition to him gaining his adamantium later on down the line, which we'll see, as well as how old he is, it offers some measure of an explanation on why he's old. Now again, it's not perfect and it's not designed to be. I mean, it's not like Jeff Lemire sits down and says, okay guys, here's a step-by-step -step answer on why old man Logan is old. We just kind of have to take it for what it is and just sort of go with it. But following this, I mean, it's really kind of a straightforward set of events. I mean, he escapes and he attacks the soldiers and then, you know, just lets some of them live because he feels bad for them. And then that's really about it. He grabs the amulet and his mind is whisked out of his body and it's raced off and it's actually sent forward in time to the point where he basically ends up becoming a part of the Weapon X project. Now, that's the reason why I like this story is because it gives us these finer moments, but it allows us to sort of explain these different scenarios that take place around it. Case in point, Weapon X for really for something like 40 years, Weapon X was just this clandestine organization that gave Wolverine his adamantium. And that's all we knew. Like it was just something that Chris Claremont, you know, writer Chris Claremont introduced to kind of expand on this backstory of Wolverine a little bit. And that's all we had. We just knew it was some company or the result of a joint venture between uh, the United States CIA and Canada's super clandestine organization, Department K. And that was it. I mean, it was the craziest thing. It wasn't until, you know, really in the, the late 1990s going into the early 2000s that we got these connections. And what Marvel ended up saying is that like Captain America was Weapon 1. There was this overarching program called Weapons Plus. And the idea was to basically stem the rise of the mutant population or something along those lines. The origins behind Weapons Plus have changed over the years. Like it's been, you know, well, some guy named John Sublime wanted to eliminate mutants because he couldn't control them. And then it was, you know, some villain named Romulus, you know, that basically engineered all the events of Wolverine's life. There have been different origins behind Weapons Plus and so on and so forth, but the common theme, at least nowadays anyway, is that there was Weapon Plus, and then under Weapons Plus, you had Weapon 1, which was Captain America Steve Rogers. The problem with this was that when Dr. Abraham Erskine injected Steve Rogers with the Super Soldier Serum, he died before he could tell anybody what the, what the formula was, and so Captain America was the only successful Super Soldier, and so, you know, Weapons Plus was basically forced to move on to Weapons 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, which eventually, you know, had like Phantom X and all all these different characters and and then it gave us weapon x which is weapon 10 and that's wolverine so again it's really kind of a cool little bit of a uh, little bit of history there when it comes to this idea but his exposure here in weapon x is two pages long it's not lengthy by any standard of measurement and it doesn't have to be because it's such an intrinsic part of wolverine's history most anybody who's ever heard of wolverine knows what weapon x is in some form or fashion even if only it's just because of what they've seen in the movies and so because of that the amulet really just kind of whisks him away and that's really the end of that and so what it does is it actually lands him in a direct conflict between the Incredible Hulk and Wendigo. Now, Wendigo, we don't need to worry about. It's That's a whole kind of ridiculous concept in Marvel, but this is actually the second or third time that Old Man Logan and the Incredible Hulk have fought one another. Now, again, the cool thing about this is a little bit of the history behind it. When Wolverine first was, you know, was first introduced to the Weapon X project, he gained his adamantium. Of course, as we know, he kind of, you know, went crazy, basically, managed to engineer his escape, and then he just stumbled off into the woods. Eventually, he was discovered by by James Hudson, I think his name was, uh, who basically became Vindicator, who was part, or I guess leader of a group called Alpha Flight. And Alpha Flight was part of a group, or really was part of Canada's Department H. And Department H was different from Department K in the sense that the Department K was like the CIA. Department H was basically an organization that was part of Canada's government that served the purpose of monitoring and dealing with superhuman threats. And so, you know, Department H would just kind of sit around and it would look at things and it would say, oh, the Incredible Hulk has stumbled into, you know, the into Canada, we have to deal with it. And so that's why Wolverine and uh, the Incredible Hulk fought for the very first time, because following his encounter with James Hudson, he was basically brought back to Department H. He received a ton of psychotherapy in order to, you know, try to bring him as close as they could to being a normal human being. And then he just started carrying all these all these different strike force missions. And so because of the fact that fighting the Incredible Hulk was basically suicide for anybody who didn't have a superpower, uh, Wolverine took up the mantle and then faced off against the Incredible Hulk for the first time. And so that's where all that kind of comes into play. But the fact remains here that with 
him facing off against the Incredible Hulk is actually kind of cool. You know, just because of the fact that it's the Incredible Hulk and it's Wendigo. Wendigo, of course, faced off against Wolverine on a multitude of occasions, which is why he's included here. And he's basically kind of akin to like a werewolf in the sense that if you're bit by a Wendigo, you will become one. Uh, that's really it. I mean, Wendigo is an actual character and he does have his own history. He's just not really important by any standard of measurement. And so because of that, it's a little bit of a familiarity here in the sense the Incredible Hulk recognizes Wolverine and it's like, hey, look, if you're fighting Wendigo and I'm fighting Wendigo, then we're friends only for Wolverine to turn on the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> and the Incredible Hulk actually gets ready to smash his head with a rock. And then of course, you know, Wolverine grabs his amulet and he's basically whisked away and transitioned back to, or I guess transition to the future, which picks up with the Phoenix Saga. And again, this is really cool because it's just these small little snippets throughout the history of his character's publications. So with the X-Men Dark Phoenix movie coming out and the casting calls and casting announcements and stuff more or less take, well, I guess the casting calls are over, but the uh, casting announcements taking place, we could probably offer a little more explanation on the Phoenix Saga than we normally would. But the Phoenix Saga was really cool because it was basically this idea that with the X-Men, you know, originally written by Stanley and Jack Kirby, it lasted for some 60 issues before they basically realized that nobody cared. And so what they ended up doing is they basically stopped creating new stories with like issue number 64 or 66 or something along those lines. And for about the next 30 issues or so, it was just reprints. So going from issue 60 something to issue 90 something, it was just reprints of stories that had already been told. And the whole reason behind this was because Marvel wanted to relaunch it somewhere along the line and they wanted to keep the story fresh in the minds of readers. And so what they ended up doing is under Lynn Wine, they launched Giant Size X-Men number one. And what that did is it basically said that the original X-Men team of Cyclops and Jean Grey and Iceman and Angel and those guys uh, had basically just been kidnapped and Xavier had to form a new X-Men team to go through and to uh, to rescue them. Now, that was where Wolverine was originally introduced to the X-Men was with this, you know, giant size X-Men number one when he was brought in as the second, you know, X-Men team. But eventually when Chris Claremont took over as writer, he looked around at the landscape of the X-Men at the time and essentially said that Jean Grey was this character who was consistently wasted. And she really was, you know, back in the old X-Men stories under, you know, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, she was just like the weakest character. Like during training sessions, she would get overwhelmed. She'd always have to be rescued by Cyclops. And to a degree, it introduced this love relationship between the two of them in the sense that he was her rescuer, but it was very much entrenched in this old school method of thinking that, you know, the damsel in distress was a was a necessity when it came to comics. And so Claremont basically wiped all that away and said, let's reinvigorate Jean Grey. And he introduced the Phoenix Force and made her one of the strongest beings that have ever, that's ever really existed in the history of Marvel Comics. And fans loved it. Fans were over the moon for Jean Grey. And they were so pissed when she died. They were so mad. I remember that. <laughs> people, they got so pissed. It was one of the craziest things to ever see. Like people were just screaming. It was something to behold. But the fact remains, when Jean Grey first arrived on the scene, it was really this essence that the, the Phoenix Force was just kind of overwhelmed with the idea of like love and hate and anger and wrath and so on and so forth. And that eventually led to the Jean, uh, to the Phoenix Force kind of having a psychotic break and then going into the Dark Phoenix Saga. But at the time that this takes place, this follows between the Phoenix and the Dark Phoenix Saga, more or less, at least it seems to be the case. But it's basically Jean Grey being a bad guy. And the reason why this matters is because as we know, there was a very strong love triangle between, you know, Jean Grey, Cyclops, and Wolverine. Of course, Jean Grey was with Cyclops, but Wolverine had always had an interest in her. And there were a few times over the course of Marvel's uh, Marvel Comics when it was basically shown that Jean Grey did love Wolverine and she actually wanted to be with him, but there, her loyalty was to Cyclops, which is the reason why that never really happened. But what this does is this really kind of forces us to face the idea of when Jean Grey basically became a villain and when she essentially took off and that was really about it. Now, this follows up to the idea of Jean Grey Gray's eventual death, which Old Man Logan, you know, Wolverine doesn't really hang around for, and he basically just bails off. From here, we actually end up jumping to Japan with a character named Mariko. Now, of all the different love interests that have existed in Marvel Comics for Wolverine, Mariko is probably one of the most important. And the reason why is because she first appeared in Uncanny X-Men number 118 in 1979, and she was the first real attempt by uh, writer Chris Claremont to flesh out the backstory of of old of uh, Wolverine. But keep in mind, when it came to like revealing the history of Wolverine, it was like, you know, a little small thing here and like a little small thing there. You know, it was never fully fleshed out because one of the most intriguing aspects of Wolverine was the mystique and the mystery that surrounded him in terms of who he was and where he came from. That was also another huge part of his story in the sense that where Weapon X had basically screwed with his memories, it was, will we uncover something new that we didn't know before? And so it basically offered writer Chris Claremont an endless possibility when it came to like all the different aspects of his origin that he could craft out, that he could flesh out, different things like that. And so of course, uh, one of the things that's shown here is that he's actually facing off against the hand. That's not super important. It's not like it's a pivotal moment in his life. It's just one of those things where Wolverine had come across a lot of different groups over the 
course of his life and faced off against a lot of different uh, a lot of different organizations one of which was the hand the fact remains that mariko was a character who again was designed to flesh things out a little bit and she was actually a, a really a woman who was the daughter of i cannot remember that guy's name for the life of me but she was the daughter of the guy who was in charge of a group called the clan yoshida i think it was and it was just one of these different organizations that existed in japan that was involved in the realm of like you know crime and different things like that like the yakuza and so on and so forth eventually wolverine killed her dad and this kind of created a i guess an engagement of sorts where the two of them became more romantically involved than they were before but eventually she actually ended up dying and uh so wolverine kind of had to leave her behind but the reason why this is cool is because it's a chance for him to go back and see her again so again it really just kind of highlights these small little moments that writers have introduced over the course of his publication history with regards to like significant moments so from here we actually end up having him you know of course grab his amulet and he's basically whisked away to madripoor now madripoor is a really really cool aspect in the realm of marvel comics and the reason why is because it's kind of like this wild west of the criminal world now there is like a law to a degree it's not like everybody just like rides around like the wild west and just shoots everything up so maybe calling it the wild west isn't the best choice of words but the fact remains that it is basically the idea that in madripoor almost anything goes now the reason why old man logan is here why wolverine's here is because of the fact that there was a point in time after the events of you know mariko and after the events of department h and weapon x and department k and all that kind of good stuff he eventually took up residence in madripoor and he basically became this sort of assassin for hire he was a soldier of fortune uh, he would basically loan his skills out to the highest bidder and in turn he would go through and just kill whoever it was that they wanted to have killed now there's a little more to it than that in terms of people who were sort of manipulating him and the fact that he had a handler and eventually turned against them and all that kind of good stuff but this was a point in his life when he was just an assassin that's really all he was and that's why madripoor has always been such an important part of the wolverine legacy because he's always gone back there's always been instances where he's revisited madripoor plus it's not very often that you see a place in marvel comics where it's like here's one place that like superheroes and like superhero teams just will not go to you don't really see it that often madripoor is really like the only place where you find that kind of thing so it's always one of these cool scenarios in this instance he had previously just kind of pissed off some kind of rival gang they ended up attacking him and of course he basically kills them all that's really about it and then we jump to his time at the xavier mansion now this is where jeff lemire invokes something really cool because something that i hope you guys have noticed so far is that this origin with the exception of you know when he was born this origin story of old man logan and wolverine are almost identical they're almost the exact same what this does is it basically has jeff lemire coming back erasing pretty much all the origin stuff that we've seen with regards to the whole you know set of events with classic wolverine or at least it seems that way and essentially saying that this is classic wolverine everything we've seen up to this point is classic wolverine the wolverine that had his adamantium ripped out the wolverine that joined the x-men at the request of charles xavier they're all basically the same the difference is the night the superheroes died and we know that with marvel comics right like we know that everything is in a singular timeline until like something huge happens and when that huge thing happens that future becomes an alternate future if it's changed so with you know the night the superheroes died that future became an alternate reality and that alternate reality could have gone two distinctly different ways one way is that it continues along the main marvel timeline where the old man logan future never happened the other reality is that it's where the old man logan future did happen and the reason why that matters is because what old man logan does is he actually tells iceman i'm going to be kidnapped by a guy named osmodeus he's going to basically send my mind spiraling throughout all space and time you have to find him and you have to stop him the whole explanation about time is the only way that i can make this make sense it's the only way that i can really consolidate these two things otherwise there's no other scenario where this makes any sense whatsoever and so again that seems to be what's going on here that at this point right here when old man logan is telling iceman about the schemes of osmodeus that the future of the supervillains taking over the world has not happened yet which means that iceman has the knowledge of old man logan being kidnapped by osmodeus and two different realities he has the knowledge of this happening in the reality when he presumably dies when the superheroes or supervillains take over the world but he also has this knowledge in the main marvel universe where things continue on as if the old man logan future never happened and so the reason why this matters is because what it does is while you know old man logan's mind basically transitions to his future self in the wasteland where he runs back into his own family iceman continues on as if the old man logan future never happened all the while having the knowledge that osmodeus is holding old man logan hostage and so we're holding him captive in some building somewhere some shack i don't know something along those lines anyway the coolest thing about this is that this deals with the idea of old man logan basically returning home back to his family because remember in the old man logan story his family was killed by the by the banner family by the hulk family they literally slaughtered his son and his daughter and his wife and the whole nine yards and so this really begs an interesting question it begs a really cool scenario because reading this you know we would be like well i mean 
know, like at some point he would have to go back. Like, why would he want to live this life out? But it makes sense because if you were suddenly yanked away from a point in your life that you absolutely adored and you were given the opportunity to go back, wouldn't you take it? You know, it's, it's like, for example, Star Trek Generations. I don't know how many of you guys saw Star Trek Generations, but there was the whole idea of the ribbon. The movie itself was not the best, but the concept of the ribbon was cool. And people who got stuck inside the ribbon were basically transported to this, you know, ethereal alternate dimension where all they did is just continue to relive the greatest moments in their lives. And there was this really cool discussion between uh, Captain Picard, Patrick Stewart. There we go. <laughs> that guy's name escaped me for a second. There's this really cool conversation between Patrick Stewart and Whoopi Goldberg, where Whoopi Goldberg talks about being pulled away. And she doesn't say I was saved or I was rescued. She says I was yanked. I was torn away because they didn't want to leave. And that's the coolest thing about this is it draws on that idea. I mean, imagine the greatest moment you've ever experienced in your life. And then imagine you could spend an eternity there. Why would you want to go? Why would you want anybody to save you? In your mind, they're not saving you. They're literally yanking you away from the thing you love and care about so much. And so initially, Old Man Logan just kind of abandons this life. He basically, you know, walks away from the whole idea of going back and being a superhero in the main Marvel Universe. He's just like, I'm back home, my family's safe. And the idea is that he can basically save his family's life. Because remember, in the Old Man Logan story, the Hulk family killed old man Logan's family while he was on a mission with Hawkeye. But if Hawkeye comes knocking on his door and says, hey, look, I need you to come on a mission with me, knowing what he knows now, he can say no. He can be there when the when the Hulk family shows up trying to kill his family, slaughter the Hulk family, and keep his family alive. And so that's the coolest thing about all this is because it presents a litany of possibilities. But the other half of this is everything that Osmodeus is doing back in the main Marvel universe. And what we end up finding out is that where, you know, the mind of old man Logan had been removed from his body and transported throughout all space and time, Osmodeus is trying to auction him off. <laughs> Osmodeus calls together like Hydra and the Hand and like Advanced Idea Mechanics and all these criminal organizations and basically says, look, I will cast a spell on him. He'll just be a vessel more or less. He'll just kind of be like an empty shell. He'll do whatever it is that you tell him to do. He'll be an assassin. He'll carry out all different kinds of missions. It's Wolverine. He's got a healing factor. He's a little older than we would normally expect, but he's got a healing factor. He's literally the perfect assassin. But in the midst of all this, because of the fact that old man Logan had told Iceman about the fact of where he'd been kidnapped and who was holding him, Iceman eventually shows up and rescues him. And so what this does is it basically forces his mind back into his body. And he's eventually just kind of, you know, required to say goodbye to his family in the old man Logan wasteland. But the reason why that's cool is because of the fact that it's a chance for him to basically say goodbye. Remember, he didn't get that during the original old man Logan story. He just came home and found his family slaughtered. And then he unleashed holy hell on the Banner family. Dude, it was one, man, it was one of the coolest things. <laughs> it was one of the coolest coolest moments in that story ever because it's just like like I remember reading old man Logan and like you turn the page you know the guy like takes off his hat and he's like oh man like dude I'm sorry to tell you man like they came while you were gone and like old man Logan opens the door and his family slaughtered and I was like oh man it's on now son and like he pops his claws and I was like yeah man like some folks are gonna die man like <laughs> holy hell it was the wrath of God man like <laughs> There was some church going on. <laughs> it was, it was, it was bananas. It was one of the coolest things that I've ever seen. But again, this is a way to just kind of write out the character. It's basically a swan song. It's a chance to basically say, look, I've wrote this great big, huge, grandiose epic, you know, even though it's only about 20, 20, uh, 20 comics or so. It's just this epic story with the character of Old Man Logan. And it's basically saying goodbye to his past, you know, because that's what he does. You know, once he's saved by Iceman, once his mind is restored to his body, you know, alongside Jean Grey and the rest of the, uh, of the superheroes, you know, he basically says, look, you know, it was a chance for me to say goodbye to the family that I had and maybe that's what I needed was to just say look it's been real and it's been good and so it's time for me to walk away it's time for me to live in the present right now as opposed to focusing on the past and so what this does is it puts him in a position to where Marvel can basically move forward with the character of old man Logan the real question to ask is will he be as good now that he's not focusing on his past that's the real question that we have to ask here but if you guys are new here to comics explain make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps if you guys enjoyed this video make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace.